they, there are a number of different ways that you can amplify specific frequencies in a way that you can't with analog sound. There are ways that you can compress the amount of sound into a narrower band so that if you only have this much hearing as opposed to this much hearing, we can get that same dynamic range in a smaller effective range. Again, now I'm using too many words that don't really make sense. It sounds like I'm talking gibberish. But in the end, trust me, you can do a lot more with teeny computers and digital sound than you could with hearing aids in the 80s, okay? The other things are uh, receiver in the canal, which really just means you got that thing behind your ear and then the speaker, instead of being integrated, is actually the speakers in the canal. So you've got a little wire, the speaker wire, loop hooks over your ear and goes in your ear. And it, the most important thing about that is it separates the microphone from the speaker. And anybody, I don't know if I can make it happen, but if I get too close to the speaker, it'll start to squeal. And anybody that's had a lot of hearing loss will know that if they cover over their ears, it starts to squeal, right? So if I can separate the microphone and the speaker, I can turn the volume up even louder without getting the squeal, okay? It also gives us the opportunity to have a microphone here and a microphone here. So we can make some distinguishing characteristics about sound that's coming from over there versus sound that's coming from over here or we can program the microphones to only hear what's right in front of them. So there are a number of different things that we can do as you get these more, that's called a directional microphone. A number of things you can do with hearing aids as you get this increased computing power. Then the last thing is, you know, those teeny stupid little batteries, right? So there are some hearing aids and hearing aid companies that are looking into, can we get a rechargeable battery D with enough energy density to be of any use, because no, people generally don't wear their hearing aids at night, so the idea is if you can just toss them on the charger and not have to futz with those batteries, that would be great. Um, those are, again, a lot of these are just bells and whistles. Um, when you look at these things, you've basically got two different classifications of hearing aids. There's, this isn't any one company, but basically you've got these the things that we usually think of as hearing aids, where there's a really small thing that goes deep in your canal, ranging up to a bigger thing, which kind of fills in that whole bowl of your ear. And this is the older version of hearing aids. Now, more, many more hearing aids are going to what are called behind the ear aids. So this thing is the receiver in the canal. So here's the speaker with a little speaker wire that hooks around behind your ear. This isn't the biggest picture, this was just the most comprehensive picture I could find, but you can't really see that she's wearing a hearing aid, right? Now, as you get to these open fit hearing aids, so that part of the trouble is if you've got some hearing, particularly in low frequencies, and we plug up your ear with a hearing aid, that changes things, it makes it not sound as good. So if we can give you these little, you've heard of, I don't know if you've seen people with these little domes, but if you get this little dome, you can let the low frequency sound in while we boost the high frequency sound using this thing. Now, those are, these are all wonderful. They've got these kind of flipped around, but these are for less hearing loss here, okay? These are for more hearing loss. And the more hearing loss you got, the more power we need, which means we need a bigger battery. The more we have to plug up your ear with an ear mold so that the sound doesn't leak back out and squeal. But those are all, that's physics, right? I mean, we're just not allowed to break those laws. And so you just got to work with what we can. What are we going to do if hearing aids don't work? Well, if you imagine hearing aids are just, uh, so we've got, we got these switches here, right? We got not as many switches as we used to. So now we're really switching those switches. And that's what hearing aids do. Well, what if there aren't enough switches to be switched? Well, if I, again, if I break that switch over there, the wire is still fine and the light is still fine. It's just a matter of me getting the energy to the wire. So cochlear implants are an option for people who have too much hearing loss to benefit from hearing aids. Now, you remember we talked about 80% of people over 80 could use hearing aids. Well, look at it another way. Of the people who would benefit from hearing aids, about 7% of those 
uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I messed up that number. Um, if you look at the people who don't benefit from hearing aids anymore, who are not getting function out of their hearing aids, only about 7% of them have gone on to have cochlear implants. However, if you look at all the people who would benefit or who use hearing aids, only about 2 to 3% of those people would benefit from a cochlear implant. So, you know, this is a good option for people with profound hearing loss, okay? This isn't a great option if you're hearing me pretty well right now, right? If you're hearing me pretty well right now, even if you're wearing hearing aids, cochlear implants probably are not a great option. These are for people who it doesn't matter how loud you shout at them, they still can't hear you. Now, the importance of that is that we're social beings, right? It is hard on us if we can't talk to people, if we can't interact with people. There's a, fair, a friend of mine from residency is doing a lot of research into the correlation between hearing loss and dementia. And hearing loss doesn't necessarily cause dementia, but there is strong evidence that says if you have dementia, and you also have hearing loss, your dementia is likely to worsen significantly faster than if you don't have hearing loss. And he's actually working on studies now which say, if we get you hearing back, either using hearing aids or cochlear implants, we can slow the slide of dementia. We can't stop it, right? That's the problem with doctors. We can make you old, but we can't make you young. But we can help with that kind of mental process. The way a cochlear implant works, this is, looks a lot like a hearing aid, right? So it's got a little microphone, and it's got a teeny little computer, and it's got a pretty big battery. And then it's got a wire that goes to this magnet. Now, this inside this coil, there's a wire. And I, if you know anything about electromagnetism, if you send an electrical signal through a wire, it induces a magnetic field. So this thing right here, kind of behind it, this is the implantable portion. This actually goes on your, uh, kind of recessed into a hole in, in your skull here, under your skin, you'll never see it. I'm the only one that ever gets to see this thing. This thing goes under your skin and into the cochlea, and that wire induces in the processor here an electrical signal that goes down this. Now you see this little, this little cork thing here. This is, you, you, know, you know what a hearing aid is about this big, right? So that's what this thing is here. Well, imagine how small that thing is, okay? So on somebody's body, here's this processor with this wire that goes to something that kind of sticks to the magnet behind their, on their scalp. And then here's the internal portion, which you never get to see. You can kind of feel it in some people. It'll be a little bump behind their skull, but it's not something you get to, to really see. But that electrode goes down through the ear and into the cochlea. And if you magnify it a lot, it looks like this. Keep in mind, this is all of about uh, seven millimeters. Each of these metal electrodes is an, an electrode. So you remember we talked about that piano, right? Well, the way our bodies are built, our ear is laid out in frequencies. So. We said that the first keys that you look at on the piano are the highest pitches, and the last keys all the way down that sleeping bag are the lowest pitches. Well, it's laid out for us so that we can stimulate each segment. The nerve is still working. All we gotta do is hook an electrical signal to it. So the cochlear implant outside takes a sound pro signal, and it turns it into a digital signal, and then it turns it into an electrical signal, and it sends it down into the cochlea, which stimulates the nerve, okay? Does that all kind of make sense so far? Okay. So this is what it looks like. The key is to get this electrode into that cochlea. This is another kind of funny cutaway drawing of it. So the way this works, similar to what we've seen before, sound, goes into the processor. The processor sends an electrical signal down into the cochlea. The cochlea, the, the hair cells are gone, so those aren't part of it, but the nerve endings are stimulated directly so that the signal goes up into your brain. Now, 
this is the schematic of how this is done. And if anybody has an interest, I've got a video of me doing this a, a while ago, but I can load that up if people want to see it. But imagine this is somebody's right ear, and this is the, the, the separation between, so here's the ear canal, and your, their ear, the cup of their ear is folded forward. And this is the separation between your mastoid cavity. So if you feel and you tap on your bone right behind your ear, there's a sinus back there, or a, a cavity called your mastoid cavity. And it's supposed to be full of air. Above this is your brain. Behind this is one of the big blood vessels that comes back from your brain and goes into your neck. And then here's the wall between the ear canal and the mastoid. So this is outside, this is normal ear canal, and this is the mastoid. Now the one thing that's in the way here, that gets in my way all the time, is what's called the facial nerve. The facial nerve is what makes your face move on that side. And your body's put together pretty weird, let me tell you. There are some strange things that go in weird places. The facial nerve goes right through your ear, comes out your skull here, and then goes forward to your face. So injury to that would make your face paralyzed, okay? Now, here's an even weirder part. The nerve that gives you taste on that half of the front half of your tongue comes out here, takes a sharp turn, goes around, runs straight across your eardrum, and then it dives deep into the, the base of your skull and it comes out with the, the nerve that gives you feeling on your tongue. It's a weird route. I don't know, I'm gonna have to talk to the guy when I get up there about why he did that. <laughs> but you gotta drill a little hole between those two. It's, it, there's actually bone, it's not a normal hole. I have to make that hole. And that distance is about two millimeters. And once I've got that hole opened up, I can see the opening into the cochlea and I can insert the electrodes through that spot. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> It actually is really, really interesting, and it's a challenge. Uh, but remarkably, there are very few complications with this. And this is actually not that big a surgery. I mean, it sounds big, and there are certainly big things near it, but it's nothing like heart surgery, right? It's nothing like belly surgery. When, when surgeons talk about this, we talk about physiologically insulting. It is, your body is just pissed off when you have heart surgery right? It really messes with your system. Having ear surgery is actually not that big a deal. It's not something you do for fun on a Friday, but it's actually not that painful, and it doesn't cause a lot of troubles. This is an outpatient surgery. About, about every time I do it, it takes me two hours and 15 minutes. Most people are up and walking around that day. Most people walk out of there, and they do just fine. So who should be having it? Well, the problem is there's all sorts of different criteria. The FDA approved the device, and they've got a different set of criteria than Medicare has. There's actually a study trying to get those two on the same page. But the technology is changing, and our understanding of the benefits you get out of it is changing. So it's shifting kind of constantly, and it also depends on who your insurance carrier is. But in the end, a pretty good measure is if when we talk to you, even when you're wearing the best hearing aids you got, you still get half the words we read you wrong, that means your hearing is not very good. And in particular, your ability to understand people is not very good, okay? If your ability to understand people is good, even if it's gotta be loud, it's probably not a good time to do this. If your ability to understand people is terrible, even with the best hearing aids you got, that's time to start talking about it, cochlear implant. It also takes a fair amount of work, particularly for the patient. This is not like glasses where you pop the glasses on and you're good to go, right? This is something that requires a real change in how your brain is interpreting signals. So you need to spend a lot of time. We, we give you programs and exercises and that sort of stuff. Some people do remarkably well. Some people don't do as well. I'll get to that in a second. But especially for children, especially children who never had hearing before this, how quickly you get this in place is very important. How much effort they put into this is very important. <clears throat> there is no age limit on the upper side. There is an age limit on the lower side. The FDA has only said down to 12 months old. So at a year old, 
technically you're able to have a cochlear implant. Really, we try and do it by about nine months old. Before nine months, it's awful hard to even prove kids have hearing loss, and oftentimes it takes a little while, but your ear, the inner ear, is actually fully formed when you're born. It's adult size. It doesn't change as you grow older. Your, your ear does, but not your inner ear. So, in terms of upper limit, there's not really an age limit. I've put in cochlear implants in people, I think the oldest one I've done was 87. Um, if you can't hear, that's a real downside. Ooh, good heavens, I couldn't hear myself there for a second. Uh, that's a real impact on your quality of life. Okay. Now, when we talked about what determines whether you do well or not, who does the best? Well, clearly people who are younger when they get it do better. Clearly people who have not had hearing loss as long do better, which makes sense, right? If I don't move my arm for seven years, well, that muscle's not gonna do much. Even if I start working it again, it's gonna take a while. So the longer you have not had hearing or the longer you have not had hearing without hearing aids, the worse you're gonna do. But I would rather have an elderly person who has only had hearing loss for six months than a young person who has had hearing loss for 15 years. No one of those factors is determinate. It's a combination of a number of factors. I would vastly prefer to have someone who is really, really motivated and works hard than someone who doesn't really care and their wife wants them to get it because they're not listening, right? So cochlear implants were developed by a guy named Bill House and another group in St at Stanford. Bill House was in LA at, at UCLA and uh, Schindler and his group were at Stanford in the 60s and 70s. And the first one was really just a live wire stuck in the cochlea and you could hear a bus which was better than nothing. By 1984, they had advanced the technology enough so that the FDA approved it. And then over the next 25 years, they refined it to the point where the hardware, the, the actual implant itself, is not really changing that much anymore. We've gotten about as good as we can get it with current computer technology, materials technology. The real advances are actually coming in the software. And the mathematical algorithm that they use to turn the sound into a digital signal is where most of the big advances are coming. So by 2012, which is the most recent numbers I know of, there had been about a third of a million implants worldwide, and we were doing about 45,000 more implants every year. Uh, there's a, a fair, fairly large proportion of those that are either in the States or in Europe. There aren't a lot of cochlear implants done uh, in third world countries because you gotta have very advanced computers and you gotta have rechargeable batteries and all this stuff. They're really expensive, right? Anybody that's bought a computer can tell you that computers are really expensive when they're small. So to have this device, the device itself is $32,000, okay? The surgery and all that stuff together is about forty-five dollars to $60,000. This is not cheap. However, there are a lot of things that we do that are not cheap, right? So how do we determine how much benefit we get out of it? It turns out there's actually a way to do that. You can do what's called a quality adjusted life years per $1,000. So Statistics is awful, but it is great. So what they do is they take surveys of how much better is your life, and they do surveys, and they get, they get what are called validated surveys. And then they figure out actuarially how long are you going to live, and then they figure out how much did the thing cost, and then they do the math problem, and they figure out that if you're in neonatal intensive care, it's very expensive, but you've got a whole bunch of years to get some quality out of that. So neonatal intensive care is actually very effective per thousand dollars. If you've got your heart blocked up, you're probably not doing too well. You haven't got that long to live. So if we give you a bypass with three vessels, it's really expensive, but you live a lot longer. So you got a lot of time to get some value out of that. And the same thing is true. When we get to cochlear implants, obviously kids live longer, so they get more benefit per year, but if you look at these, cochlear implants do better than defibrillators, cardiac transplant, hypertension medications, tuberculosis screening, knee replacement, one vessel bypass, uh, dialysis. 
So we spend an enormous amount of money on other treatments that prolong your life. It's reasonable to spend money on treatments that make your life better. Now the other thing is, and this, none of this, this is all from August of 2000, so this is very old data at this point. We're getting in, the studies that we do in cochlear implants now are so complex, they're just, they're really hard to explain. This is just a really, you know, sensible way to explain it. But, um, don't know where I was going with that. Sorry, just lost my train of thought. So, again, ways to, to, val to evaluate how much better are you going to do. So this was a simple... Uh, technique. Again, we've got very complex ways to study how do people do, but this was a good way to look at it. So before surgery, in this particular group of patients, they only understood 10% of words read to them on a list. Now, everybody's, anybody that's ever had a hearing test remembers that thing where they go, hot dog, baseball, airplane, right? They want to hear, you don't get any clues as to what we're talking about. Right? We just want to know, can you make sense of the word we're saying? And if you only get 10% of those before surgery, at three months, they got 75% of them right. At a year, they got 85% of them right. Now, if you made it noisier, it's obviously it's harder. It's harder for everybody to hear in noisy environments. But if you got 15% right, you got 55% at six months or three months, and 70% right in a noisy environment at a year, that's a massive change in your ability to communicate with people. And that, that's, a, that's an easy kind of reference point for how to figure out. There are all sorts of other studies looking at, does it involve other comorbidities like dementia? What about kids and educational achievement? What about uh, people that are deaf and, and their productivity in the workplace? There are all sorts of these studies that we've done. But they get really complicated and we could be here for hours and hours. Again, factors that predict success, how long you've been hard of hearing, how old you are when this thing goes in, how much you really want to work on this. And then the other thing is you got to understand, <laughs> this is a man-made machine. This is nowhere near as good as the, the incredibly intricate, delicate mechanism that you were born with. We're not replacing that, right? We're trying to bypass the problem, but if you expect that you're going to go and you're going to head back to the symphony and you're going to hear just like somebody sitting next to you without hearing loss, that's not really realistic. But if you expect, I want to be able to communicate better with my friends and family because that's what makes my life fun, then you're much more likely to be happy with it. The advances in cochlear implants, a lot of them honestly are the same thing as the hearing aids digital processing. Cochlear implants aren't really possible without digital processing, but miniaturization of circuitry. Most cochlear implants are now rechargeable, so you just stick it on a stand right next to your bed and it recharges overnight. Uh, some of the companies actually make water resistant or waterproof things so you can bring it to the beach or do whatever. Um, there are a number of companies, I don't have any pictures of them, this is all sort of experimental. There are a number of companies that are trying to move towards totally implantable cochlear implants. That's still a ways off, but that would be eliminating that whole thing that looks like a hearing aid. There's still some problems because you gotta have a battery, right? How are you gonna have a battery that you, you, it's fully implantable? There are some ways around that. That's a little ways off. I'm not gonna get too deep into that. But there are a number of really exciting things that are on the horizon with cochlear implants. Probably the most important thing that we're changing, initially when, back in the 60s when Bill Howe started doing this, when you open the inner ear, when you put that electrode in, especially with the techniques and the tools and the, and the microscopes and the things we had in the 60s, it basically destroyed the ear. Any hearing you had left was, was crashed, was toast. With much more modern techniques, and really what I'm talking about is instrumentation and really high magnification microscopes and really modern stuff. We can actually preserve the, the function, what's left of your hearing. So now instead of having a cochlear implant which relies entirely on that electrode, we can put one of these in here, right? And you remember we saw the hearing aids with those receiver in the canal? 
all, I mean, most of the hearing aid companies, all of the things they do, all you got to do is hook that little receiver right on the front, and it can then put in sound and electrical stimulation. So that in the low frequencies, these are the ones that don't work quite as, uh, that don't work quite as well with cochlear implants, but we can get you some sound with the uh, hearing aid portion, which sounds a little more natural. It sounds a little bit more like native hearing and then get you amplification with the cochlear implant in this. I'm sorry, I didn't explain this. This is, this is a hearing test. So these are frequencies, these vertical lines. So this is the very bottom pitch, like the bottom pedal on an organ. This is the very high pitch, like the piccolo in the orchestra. This is zero sound, right? This is very, very, very loud sounds. If your hearing is above 25, it's normal. If it's mild, moderate, severe, profound hearing loss. So cochlear implant patients tend to be here. As we get better with these, they're saying, and this is when I say the criteria are changing, you actually don't have to have anywhere near as bad a hearing loss as we realize how much benefit you get out of, here, out of cochlear implant. So if we can use the hearing aid and the cochlear implant, there are a number of studies looking at how much better people do as a result of that combination. So the future, expanding the criteria, trying to meet up the FDA criteria with the Medicare criteria and other insurance, trying to get some sort of standardization about how we're and why we're doing this. And then lots more research in how does this impact the quality of life? Who would do well? What other things can we do to make you do well? Uh, particularly in improving the quality at the, in, in the end of life as we're talking about people that are elderly. Oh, that's me. So we got a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions about any of this stuff? Sir? Right. Then the well, usually what, <clears throat> so in the state of Michigan, if, you, if you're going to buy hearing aids, you either have to sign a waiver that says, I don't care if there's something medically wrong with me, I want to buy hearing aids anyway, or you have to get a doctor to say it's safe. And there's a lot of debate about is that a worthwhile thing, but I've seen a number of people who have very scary causes of hearing loss, tumors and that sort of stuff, that got hearing aids and the, the audiologist kept cranking them higher and higher and then they ended up having something really dangerous. Most of the time, it's just, hey, do you have any wax packed in your ear? Do you have any infection? Do you have fluid? Do you have some other genetic cause? And so seeing a doctor, in my mind, granted I'm biased, I'm a doctor, but there's a value to it, right? What we're looking to do is, is there anything dangerous? That's a lot of what doctors do. Is there anything that's dangerous that we should be aware of before we just go ahead? So from my standpoint, if you think you have hearing loss and you're interested in looking, should I get hearing aids? Should I get a cochlear implant? You call my office and it's here and there's cards and stuff around, but call the office and say, I'm having trouble hearing or my, my husband is having trouble hearing is what we usually hear, <laughs> but I can't help you with listening. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not listening, I got nothing. But um, you come in and you have a hearing test, and then I see after, and we look at the hearing test and try and figure out what, if anything, is going on, how bad is it, and would you benefit from hearing aids or a cochlear implant? A lot of people say, do I have to have hearing aids? I'm never going to make you buy hearing aids. I'm not going to come to your house and put them in your ears. If you don't like them, you're not going to wear them, right? Don't buy hearing aids if you don't want them. It's a waste of money. They're teeny computers, and they're expensive, and they're almost never covered by insurance. They are very, very good for people who don't get to do the things they enjoy doing because they can't hear. If you're not eating dinner with your family at a table because you can't hear, that, that stinks. That, that's not fun, right? If you're sitting up in your room because it's too loud down in the dining hall, that's not fun. Right? You're missing out on that part of your life. 
one of the strangest things I ever, one of the strangest studies I saw was there's a study that says one of the most common symptoms of hearing loss is paranoia. <laughs> I thought, paranoia? That sounds weird. But I'm not talking about like conspiracy paranoia. I'm talking about, what did they just say? Did they just, are they making fun of me? What, why don't I get that joke? And that's paranoia. Now it's not obviously the same kind of paranoia, but it's a problem. It's a, it's a feeling of being left out. And so if, if you're not doing the things that you would enjoy, you ought to at least try them. Now, my brother, he's got glasses and he can't walk five feet without them. He never loses his glasses. He loves them, right? He never breaks them. He never goes anywhere without them. They make his life better. People who recognize that their life is better, they take care of their hearing aids. They don't lose them. They're glad they got them. They, they, yeah, they are kind of a pain at times. You got to change the batteries and you got to get them programmed and all that stuff. But if they make your life better, you're going to remember. Now, the same thing is true. My brother, when he got glasses in the sixth grade, he went to the eye doctor and he walked out with glasses and he walked out and he goes, whoa, there are leaves on the trees, right? He had totally forgotten what it was like to have normal vision because he hadn't, it didn't happen fast, right? Nobody, well, that's not true. Some people lose their hearing fast, but most people don't. Most people slowly, progressively lose their hearing. And today isn't that much different than yesterday. And so you kind of become accustomed to it and you watch my hands and you look at my lips and you kind of know what I'm talking about. So you fill in the gaps. It's only once the gaps get wide enough that you can't understand people. And that's when it gets to be a real problem. So the hardest part is checking them out, right? You don't know what you're missing until you find out what it is that we can do to fix it. And sitting in a quiet room listening to a guy with a microphone on, that's not a very good measure of do you have hearing loss. Sitting in a noisy dinner table, that's a much better measure. And if everybody else can hear you, or I'm sorry, everybody else is communicating but you can't hear, that's probably a measure of having hearing loss. Or the other one, my favorite one is <clears throat> um, kids, they mumble nowadays, right? <laughs> kids mumble nowadays, does everybody agree? No, they don't. Well, that's not entirely true. Some of them do. But high frequencies are the first frequencies you lose, right? Low frequencies usually are preserved pretty long. Well, what are low frequencies? Vowels. A, O, A are vowels. High frequencies are consonants. S, T, K, right? Consonants are what give you the crispness in speech. So if I take out all the vowels, I'm sorry, if I take out all the consonants from speech because I can't hear high frequencies, what am I going to hear? <laughs> right? Kids don't mumble. Kids have higher pitched voices. And the consonants are dropped out so you can't hear them. Now, if the kids mumble, they ought to not mumble. But it's usually that you can't hear as well. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, we're still putting air in a tire here a week weeks ago. Blew out, Ooh. And, and I've lost most of my hearing in one ear. Okay. And it sounds like real high, but every time I follow, I get a bird bird noise in, in my ear. Sure. Now, uh, I've tried on scheduling a thing with you to find out if that's something that's permanent or what, what, what's going to have to happen. Yeah. And then the second question is, my wife came to you here a few years ago after her family doctor lady doctor at that, I might tell you. Whoa, I'm going to back away from that one. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. She was driving to my wife to, to get a candle to get the Ooh. wax out of her ear. I traveled all over to all the drugstores. Nobody had it. Yeah. And I finally bought that nature thing. But she never used it. She came to you yeah. and, and her problem got solved. Okay. <laughs> so the more important one, loud sounds can do a lot they can burst your eardrum. They can cause trauma. Now, at this point, there's not, there, really, the problem is there's not a ton that we can do about this because damage is damage, right? You're not a car. I can't replace your quarter panel, right? So I can't rewire your ear. Now, it is worth looking at, and it is worth, if nothing else, getting a hearing test to try and figure out, is it because of a blown eardrum or is it because of acoustic trauma? Now, your body is actually remarkably good at fixing itself. So even blown out eardrums will oftentimes heal themselves, 
The one caveat is actual explosions. So veterans who have undergone explosions, oftentimes the burn will destroy their eardrum and it won't heal. But just a pressure or like kids water skiing and they whack their ear, that'll generally heal itself. Um, the healing process usually takes a week to six weeks. It kind of depends on how bad or what type or something like that. But it, it is very helpful to get the hearing test to know where were you, if nothing else to know, is it getting better? And part of the trouble with a hearing test is they're only a measure of that period of time, that point in time. So you need to have hearing tests to try and figure out what's happening. And they're, they're not, hearing tests are not a big deal. I mean, you just sit there and you push a button when you hear a sound. There's no poking or prodding or anything. But we do need to get the hearing test to try and figure out what's going on. Um, regarding the candling, it is my fervent belief that you should not light things on fire next to your body. I, when I first came out of residency, I was in practice, and a guy came and he insisted that there was lots of wax in his ear, and I had to take it out because he would put this candle in his ear. The candle is made of wax paper, and he would burn the wax, and the wax would melt, and it would go in his ear, and he would pull out, wait for it, wax. And he insisted that that was all wax from his ear. Well, his ear was beautiful. It was spick and span, and he demanded that I take wax out of his ear. My advice on wax is wax has got a really bad rap, okay? Wax is antifungal, and it's antibacterial, and it's like when you wax your car, right? What happens to the beads of water on your car when you wax it? They slide right off. If you go in there with a Q-tip, which looks like steel wool, and you wipe all that wax out, now that water soaks into the skin, and you've wiped away the antifungal and the antibacterial stuff that God put there for you, and so you get ear infection. Or, has anybody ever seen a musket loaded? Right, you take that ramrod and you shove the wad down in there. If you take that Q-tip and you shove the wax further down in there, it gets awful hard to get it out of there. Now, it's very unlikely that you're going to injure yourself other than if you get an infection. But please, I beg of you, don't walk anywhere with Q-tips in your ears. From personal experience, don't do that. Anyway, other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. A lot of people I know won't wear them because they get feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding tinnitus, what will that amplify the tinnitus ringing in the ear? Nope. So his question is number one, what about the feedback? And number two, what about the ringing in the ears? Uh, tinnitus is how I say it. Tinnitus is fine too. I, I don't. I don't mean to to second guess you on that one. It's just pronunciation. Um, the feedback is. It's kind of physics. It's hard to argue with physics. However, you can have a conversation with physics. If we can use different strategies to supp suppress that feedback loop, if we can use the computer to break the feedback loop, if we can separate the microphone and the speaker, we can do better. If you've got a bunch of wax in your ear, the sound goes into the ear canal and it bounces right back off and it makes it squeal. So, again, you can't argue with physics. Eventually, if you make it loud enough or if the sound leaks back, you'll get feedback. But there are a number of strategies to minimize it. It really just requires that you know you have an audiologist who helps you with it. Exactly. Exactly. And so if you think about, I mean, I don't have, I didn't put an awful lot of, of audiograms in here, but this is a pretty typical type of hearing loss, right? You've got mild hearing loss in the low frequencies, downsloping to moderate to severe. And this, is, this would look like age-related hearing loss. Well, you remember that graphic equalizer thing? This is the treble and this is the bass. If we make everything louder, that'll drive you crazy, right? It's just too loud. And one of the cruel things about hearing loss is if things are too soft, you can't hear them. But if they're too loud, they hurt, right? And that's called recruitment. So your ear is set up to be on high alert when it's really, really, really quiet. And all of those nerves are standing upright, and they're all at attention. And 
as it gets a little bit louder, your ear starts to detect it, and so it lets some of those stand down. Now, if you've got hearing loss down here, it's got to get awfully loud before the nerves start standing down. But the gap between awfully loud and painful is very narrow, right? So the kids come in and they say to grandpa, you know, hey, grandpa, can you hear me? And they say no. So then they shout at you, right? <laughs> right? I remember my grandpa doing that because I wasn't a doctor then. But, so, but that's, that's one of those things. Now, the, the benefit of digitizing this sound is we can manipulate the sound that we present to your ear and functionally distort it in a way so that you can hear it better. Now, one of the complaints is that makes it sound kind of mechanical. Okay. <laughs> so so they, it makes it sound kind of mechanical. So what ends up happening is it sounds kind of distorted. Well, that's what we're doing. We're distorting it. Yeah. If you find yourself that we have trouble picking one conversation out of multiple conversations, is that the beginning of your loss anymore? Yeah, yeah. Is that losing your high frequency? Um, it's, it's more a matter of what your body does or what your brain does with the sound. So your, your brain is set up to have symmetric hearing. And if something is louder on this side, then you tend to look at it, right? If nothing is changing over here, you don't look at it so much. If you know you want to talk to Sally or Bill, and you know what their voice sounds like, your brain says, huh, listen to that. And it'll actually turn the volume down on your other ear. But if you have asymmetric hearing, that thing goes out the window. If you have less input, it gets harder and harder for you to kind of separate out those various signals. So that's kind of a factor, not so much of what frequency you've lost, but that you've lost anything at all. Because now your brain is having a harder time kind of filling in the gaps and pinpointing where things are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a whole separate thing that we didn't talk about. So sudden sensory neural hearing loss is a problem that happens. Let me preface this by saying we don't actually know why. Um, part of the trouble is we can't look in your ear. And most of the things that happen to your ear are not visible to x-rays or to MRIs or anything like that. Most of these things are, are biochemical. And so we have to make some guesses. Now, in sudden sensory neurohearing loss, what we think is happening is that your immune system is fighting something, usually a virus. You get a cold, you get some sniffles, and your immune system takes that virus and it breaks it into pieces and it looks at those pieces and it makes proteins to, to find those pieces and get rid of them. And that's how you get rid of a virus. There, this is in an autoimmune disease, auto self immune. You're, you're usually immune to yourself, but in an autoimmune disease, your immune system starts to attack yourself. Well, there's lots of examples of that, but in this particular one, some part of, in this case, the virus, looks an awful lot like some part of your inner ear. And your body's going along its business and it's trying to fight that virus and it all of a sudden starts creating some injury to your inner ear until it goes, whoa, whoa, hang on. If it goes, whoa, fast enough, you can repair some of that damage. If it hasn't gone, whoa, fast enough, and you've lost a lot of hearing, it's not as likely to come back. So that is not an uncommon thing. I see it about once every week or two, somebody comes in. There is one thing that we can do for that. Now, in that setting, that's called an autoimmune disease, where your immune system is... Uh, causing inflammation in this case. We can give you steroid pills and we can actually give you a steroid injection into your ear that can help minimize how much damage your immune system does. However, that's only useful in the first three days to two to three weeks. Once that inflammation has done its, done its damage, there's nothing we can do to bring it back. And in all honesty, even if we look at how well does that work, 
about 50% of people get some of their hearing back. And if they take the pills and the shot, about 60 to 70%. So it's not like if you didn't do this, man, you lost out. You lost that marginal improvement. I say that only because that's all we've got. I mean, that's the only thing that we can do about it. Now, there are other, and I don't have time to, to talk about all of it, but there are other strategies to try and figure out how do we deal with one-sided hearing loss. Because much like your question, if you've got one-sided hearing loss and you can't hear on this side, and Sally's talking over here, you go, what? What? Yeah. And you have trouble, you have trouble figuring out where things are, and it's very, very frustrating. So there are a number of other options for how to figure out how do we balance that out? How do we use the hearing you've got left to make your hearing function a little more normally? So, yeah. How do you know about hyperacusis and anxiety? Well, so uh, hyperacusis and anxiety is her question. So hyper, a lot, acusis, hearing, so, and then anxiety. Well, if you think about what anxiety and stress are, stress is really just, or anxiety is just your body saying, that's a lion and it's going to eat me, right? That's what we're sort of built to have as our response. It's called the fight or flight response. And if you see a lion or if you see, you know, a guy with a gun, your first response is, right? And your muscles tense up and your pupils dilate and your guts shut down and the blood goes to your muscles and your hair stands up on end. That's a biochemical process that happens in your body. And the idea behind that is it makes you acutely aware of everything going on around you. You've heard of people in fights. They talk about, like, everything slowed down. And all of a sudden, I could, I, I could see everything that was happening around me. That's your body going, what am I going to do? Well, the problem is our bodies were built to do that and either run or fight. And either we got eaten by the lion or we got away, right? We weren't built to be anxious for a long period of time. We weren't built to have office politics. We weren't built to have family tension, right? We weren't built to have spouses who are long-term ill, right? Stress on your body is a great short-term option. It's a terrible long-term option. So what happens is with hyperacusis or with tinnitus or with other things, your body goes, <gasps> and it starts to think about all the things that are going on, and it amplifies all of those symptoms. And that's what you're feeling. That, and that's why those two things go together. So what do you treat? The anxiety? The, the hyperacusis, well, so it depends on why you've got hyperacusis. If you have hearing loss and you're having recruitment, then the best we can do is try and treat the hearing loss. But in the end, yeah, you treat the anxiety, but the question is how, right? I mean, if your spouse is ill, what am I gonna tell you? Don't be so stressed out? That's stressful right? That's just not a good, I mean, we're, we're really not very good at that. But that is a huge impact on our quality of life and our, our experience of the world around us. It's very important. So, sir. Yeah, so Meniere's disease is, a, is a, an inner ear pathology. Meniere's disease is a problem where the fluid in this middle tunnel builds up and the pressure gets worse and worse and worse until eventually these very thin little membranes will rupture. Now what I didn't tell you about this thing is that these two tunnels are connected and they're separated from this one. And this tunnel has a whole lot of potassium in it and this tunnel has a whole lot of sodium in it and it specifically keeps those two apart. And when you flip the switch, it makes it switch like this. So, this whole functions like a battery. Well, if this thing ruptures, the battery's all thrown out of whack. And that number one makes you, with Meniere's disease, you get ringing in your ear and fullness and pressure and hearing loss, which kind of culminates and crescendos into an episode of vertigo where you feel like you're spinning around. Vertigo is called the illusory sense of spinning. Now, the other thing I didn't tell you is that this is the cochlea, but there's a whole other part of your inner ear which is devoted to balance. When those two fluids mix, you get this horrible, horrible sense of vertigo. And it takes a little while, but eventually, just like you stop bleeding from a cut, eventually it stems the flow and it kind of 
reestablishes the battery and you feel like crap for a day or two. Every time that happens, it causes some damage to those. It's very, very traumatic to these. So people with Meniere's disease, they get hearing loss and it gets better, but not quite normal, and hearing loss and it gets better, but not quite normal. And eventually, it tends to cause significant hearing loss. Now, we don't really know why people get Meniere's disease. We don't know if you're making too much of it or if you're not reabsorbing enough or if it's totally unrelated and the fluid buildup is from something else. Uh, the best that we can have is to try and pull some of the fluid out of that chamber and decrease the pressure. Eventually, most people kind of burn out their Meniere's disease. We don't really influence it. We can kind of manage the symptoms while you've got it, but we can't really stop it from happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Well, the first thing I'll say is it's very unlikely that the hearing loss is affecting their balance, right? So we, we as humans, we want very much to say, if this, then that, right? I washed my car today, so it rained. Well, those things aren't true, right? So your hearing loss is actually not causing your balance trouble the thing that's causing your hearing loss is also probably causing your balance trouble. So correcting your hearing loss won't do anything to the underlying problem. Now, the question is, what's the underlying problem? If it's Meniere's disease, then we can try and treat that. But if you don't have vertigo, it's not Meniere's disease. So the hard part is getting through that process of what's causing your balance trouble in the first place. Does that make sense? So if you're looking for a hearing aid to improve your balance, that has nothing, that's not going to work at all, right? Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah, ma'am. Well, I mean, that, that gets into an area where we're not 100% clear as to what's going on. There, certainly, this is the primary driver of hearing loss, but there's also people who seem to hear sounds okay, but they can't make much sense of it. And that's believed to be more a process of trouble with how your brain turns sound into meaning. And so there's thoughts that there's a, a cochlear hearing loss, meaning this, versus a neural hearing loss. The problem is we don't have good ways to distinguish one from the other. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I could necessarily say that's true, uh, meaning if you wear your hearing aids more, you'll get better at them. That is definitely true with cochlear implants. However, I think that one of the questions is, are the hearing aids set up appropriately, which is actually remarkably difficult. I mean, we sort of take for granted that you get glasses and they fit right, right? We just assume the prescription is right. Well, it takes, it's a lot more difficult to set up hearing aids just right. So that would be the first thing. Then the other question is, is there some other problem with what we call auditory processing? Well, we have less options for modifying that. That tends to be much more like seeing a, an occupational therapist, right? We, we give you some exercises to try and improve that function. Any, yes, sir. What's the difference between a Baja hearing aid and a cochlear implant? So a Baja, a bone-anchored hearing aid, don't call it a bone-anchored hearing aid because insurance doesn't pay for hearing aids, so <laughs> if you call it a hearing aid, they won't like that. It's called a Baja. So a Baja is not related to sensory neural hearing loss at all, with one caveat. If you have conductive hearing loss, meaning there's something wrong with the eardrum, ear bones. If we vibrate the skull and it vibrates the cochlea, that will directly stimulate the nerve, right? If you've got chronic ear disease and a draining ear and all sorts of problems in here and you've had five surgeries in here, but this thing is working great, 
it's a way to bypass this broken system. The only other, the only way it relates to uh, sensory neural hearing loss is to, to do with what you had mentioned, which is one-sided hearing loss. If you can't hear on this side, I can't make that ear work, but I can put a Baja here to, to direct the sound into the other ear. And so that way, at least you can hear the people on this side of you, even though it's through this ear. And people get a, a significant improvement in their ability to hear in noise with a Baja. A cochlear implant is totally different. It's a much more involved surgery. A Baja is a pretty easy kind of superficial surgery where they put a little metal screw here. And I do that too. Uh, I just didn't cover it in this, this talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming. Have a great night.